Welcome back to my disembodied voice. One thing which has been around since the early stages of society and its Neanderthal to Luddite ignorance of the world we were developing in is justice. Now, far from the medieval days of being tortured by some of the most horrific devices ever devised to being thrown in a dungeon and starved into madness and death, the concept of right and wrong in society has been a cornerstone of our civilization. Animals may expel other animals from a herd or pack, and the weak may get left behind out of survival instincts and battles against predators, but no other species has a system where trials are held or commensurate punishment is meted out to transgressors or wrongdoers. And this thesis of justice, right and wrong, restorative versus punitive, and redressing the odds has been in cinema since its early dawn. Even now, in the dying superhero genre, the genesis of the hero's development, personality, and ideology is often suited in having great power and great responsibility, standing up for truth and justice, doing what's right, giving back to those who've been tyrannised and stopping evil from taking over. Be it Tony Stark in Iron Man who saw the devastation his weapons caused to innocent people and so decided to become a weapon to fight those who were killing civilians, to Spider-Man in Sam Raimi's original movie where the geeky and bullied kid followed the mantra of his dying uncle to stop the villain from killing people because he had a moral duty, superhero films are very much about right, wrong, nobility and justice. Then we have the revenge genre, where one egregious act of harm is cancelled out by an even more egregious act of vengeance, often where the law has failed or the perpetrators would face no real consequences for the crime they have committed, and in that genre, one I adore, the whole point is to get the audience emotively engaged in the violence of righting wrongs. And even in TV shows, be it detectives hunting serial killers or gifted teenagers falling in love and fighting the dangers of the upside down, characters are defined through injustice, facing insurmountable odds or correcting the wrongdoing of the evil villains. But how does justice work in our brains? How come electrical synapses and chemical reactions create a sense of right, wrong, and want commensurate outcomes to heinous crimes. Remember, as I've said before, if I cut your brain open, there'd be no pictures, sounds, or visible memories, because everything in the brain is coded via sensory information and electrical impulses. So, in the real world, when a serial killer like Lucy Letby is convicted, or you hear an old lady being robbed, or even see a good Samaritan on Instagram helping the homeless, how does right, wrong, justice and morality affect our brains? Well, join me today as we look at how justice affects your brain and why reason and righteousness feel so good when we are convinced that something wrong has been corrected. Well, first things first, a lengthy study by French neuroscientist Jean Doucetti looked into this and felt that the first evidence for the role of justice sensitivity in enhanced neural processing of moral information is in specific components of the brain network involved in moral judgment. And for this, we need to look at our old friend, the frontal lobe. Our enlarged frontal lobe is what makes us human, for although all mammals have frontal lobes, human brains and frontal lobes are larger in proportion. So, what does your frontal lobe do? Well, let's take a tour of its major features and functions. Reasoning. This includes simple and complex processing of information. Logic, reasoning, judgment, decision making and creativity all fall into this category. Social understanding. Your frontal lobe controls your understanding of social norms and helps determine what you should and shouldn't do or say. Executive functions. Some examples of these include self-control and inhibitions, attention span and working memory. Voluntary muscle movements. These are intentional movements such as moving your hand to pick something up or moving your legs to stand up and walk around. 
Your frontal lobe also contains the brain area that controls the muscles you use for speaking, learning and recalling information. This is your brain's ability to process and learn new information for later use. Your frontal lobe also helps retrieve information later. Overall, your frontal lobe is crucial for memory, emotions, impulse control, problem solving, social interaction, motor function, learning, and of course, judgment. Now, using magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI brain scanning device, Ducetti's team studied what happened in the participants' brains as they judged videos depicting behavior that was morally good or bad. But the brain imaging yielded surprises and during the behavior evaluation exercise, people with high justice sensitivity showed more activity than average participants in parts of the brain associated with higher order cognition. Now, higher order cognition is composed of a range of sophisticated thinking skills. Among the functions subsumed under this category of neurodevelopmental function are concept acquisition, systematic decision making, evaluative thinking, brainstorming, which includes creativity and rule obedience. Ducetti found that brain areas commonly linked with emotional processing were not affected. So, Ducetti's conclusion was that individuals who are sensitive to justice and fairness do not seem to be emotionally driven. Rather, they are cognitively driven. But is this correct? Surely, when we're watching the news about serial killers, rapists, child abusers, or even politicians who've been caught with their hands in the metaphorical cookie jar, we get upset by this, and our emotions drive our thinking. Well, Justice does engender what we call primal and raw emotions, such as anger, compassion, empathy and fairness. After all, anger is an instinctive emotion to unfairness and compassion is a natural emotion when we see something like an animal suffering. Also, we feel empathy when parents who have lost a child are seen crying at press conferences as we are moved by their verbal and non-verbal cues. And it's here that we also thank the stars that our child is still alive because the very thought of losing your precious baby boy or girl is too painful to comprehend. And this, in a way, drives a more vicarious sense of justice. And the philosopher Plato stated that justice is about balance and harmony. And if we factor in that anger is a response to something which is wrong and supplies us with the energy to make it right, then we are in the reactively emotional side of the brain, which is called the limbic system, which occupies both the frontal and temporal lobe. Now, your temporal lobe is a part of your brain that helps with the senses and also enables us to understand and respond to the world around us. It plays a key role in how we communicate our ability to access memories, use language and also process emotions. And sat in the middle of the limbic system is that lovely almond shaped device called the amygdala. Not to be confused with the amygdala, which is something completely different. As stated above, the amygdala's name refers to its almond like shape. Located right next to the hippocampus, which is where we store memories, the left and right amygdalae play a central role in our emotional responses, including feelings like pleasure, fear, anger and anxiety. The amygdala also attaches emotional content to our memories and so plays an important role in determining how robustly those memories are stored. Memories that have strong emotional meaning tend to stick. Now, the amygdala also plays a key role in forming new memories, specifically ones that are related to fear. Fearful memories are able to be formed after only a few repetitions. This makes fear learning a popular way to investigate the mechanisms of memory formation, consolidation and recall. And like Plato said, one thing which justice does is restore balance and harmony. And that's because when you're watching the daily drip feed of terror on the news, the fear that the odd man next door might be the next John Wayne Gacy, or you might end up in a maternity ward under the next Lucy Letby, or that everyone is carrying a knife and there isn't enough police to respond to the next inevitable burglary because society is collapsing. Well, the amygdala, damn it, I mean the amygdala, 
forms a strong association with this and when rapist or stabby mcstab stabbers and serial killers are sentenced whilst we might want a netflix documentary to understand them we know that they won't be able to hurt people anymore they're locked away from society and therefore we have a sense of balance however in movies be it the revenge genre superhero movies or even the recent vigilante squad movie six underground we are told that governments or law enforcement are either corrupt and ineffectual and then because of that we need something from the common sense frontal parts of our brain to address this clear act of omission and within our emotive parts of our brain pardon the people who are committing the crimes because attacking violence with more violence addresses and rights that wrong it's partly why the police officer Gene Hunt from the TV show Life on Mars and Ashes to Ashes on the BBC in the UK was loved by so many as clearly a maverick operating by his own rules. He broke all the rules to ensure that the bad guys got nicked and put away. And for superheroes, they possess intellect or strength way beyond ours. So when Spider-Man stops a bank robbery or Batman catches a killer, our brains process their methods, which may be outside the law at times, as logical, necessary and, therefore, acceptable as the regular law is unable to restore that sense of balance that our emotive side wants. Judge Dredd, for example, takes no crap, but he also abides by the law. He even calls himself the law and being a stickler for rules but psychotic enough to slaughter a perp who challenges him meets all the basic tenets of our psychological acceptances into what a fair society should be now i know judge dread is set in a dystopian future world but the grounding of law and right or wrong is what drives that entire comic book slash films it's also where we come to frame of reference and individual perception because whilst we all experience similar emotions our perceptions and reasonings often based on experience or naivety are all very different that's why if i got 100 people there will be very different ideas about the death penalty castration for rapists or avoidance of jail for drug addicts or shoplifters based upon your own frame of reference and a perception of society then when we add context like the perp only shoplifted because he hadn't eaten for days after being evicted from his home or the man sent to the electric chair was found innocent 10 years later by dna testing that our sense of justice is tested and we base new outcomes on new information however as justice cannot be about waiting 10 years and not every shoplifter is stealing because they haven't eaten for days we fall into the realm of majorative and pejorative and that means that we assume multiple crimes under one category and that category is generally disapproved of regardless of mitigation and this is where jean doucette's discussion about the brain acting mostly on logic is tested because if mr stabby mcstabstab killed your wife or your child then you would have an emotional reaction and your perception of justice would be more than likely to be an eye for an eye it's personal and therefore individual and your sense of justice is stronger with the emotive connection yet if mr stabby mcstabstab killed someone in huddersfield who you don't even know then whilst you think it's wrong and that person needs to go to jail he falls under the majority term of getting locked up and off the streets as per society's rules as you can put logical processing where the brain knows the crime and figures out the appropriateness of the time in prison based upon the laws of the land basically if mr stabby mcstabstab hasn't killed someone you know then we can remove the emotivity part of it and return to the logical and balanced part also when it comes to majorative and pejorative we lump people with the same outcome and therefore can see people as one-dimensional stereotypical and reductive that's why in john wick the act of the gang killing keanu reeves's dog means that everyone who is killed after that is justified because they are either connected to protecting the perp or has links to underground crime which we know is crippling the city that means that lead bad guy vigo's son is treated with the same contempt as the 400 goons wick slaughters on his mission of vengeance and why even when auntie doris who's bringing her son's lunch to the warehouse gets shot the context of it being innocent auntie doris doesn't matter because justice and the restoration of balance means that 
everyone has to die. And as voyeurs, we have a damn good time watching it on film. And in I Spit on Your Grave or the Shudder produced film Revenge, there are no police about. And even if the police were involved, it's rape and the issue of his word against hers, lack of evidence or a corrupt law enforcement being involved means the woman is outnumbered and all the odds are stacked against her. And this is very visible. So once the wronged and assaulted woman picks up her knife, gun or garden shears and begins castrating, shooting or torturing her assailants, it feels cathartic as having seen the rape and the awful crime. There is no ambiguity in the retaliation and, as the antagonists are often painted with broad strokes of despicableness, we want reactive justice and not restorative. Also, in those movies, the punishment tends to be inverted, medieval or just painfully extreme. In other words, something like castration or a slow and painful death, because the villain's punishment must exceed the protagonist's suffering in terms of pain. Let's say they made I Spit on Your Grave 7, where the villains have to complete a lengthy court trial and also take part in apologising to the victim, and then we see them getting beaten up in prison. Well, that might be a gripping drama, but it lacks the primal thrill our emotive brains desire when we see said rapists getting castrated by garden shears because we want them to feel the brutality of justice and... The protagonist's suffering has been so heinous that the only way to restore balance is by raising that torture a level so that theirs is even more egregious and more painful. And it's important here that I talk about punitive and restorative because punitive is about punishing someone, i.e. castrating them with shears, and restorative is about making them understand what went wrong and bringing them back into society so they can function. In other words, apologising to the victim and then going on to lead a fairly normal life with no more crimes being committed. However, in terms of films like I Spit on Your Grave, brutality is the order of the day here and the film is about voyeurism, so the protagonist's responses are meant to be extreme. As I have cited in neuro-linguistic programming, our brains store information through our senses and without our senses of sight, smell, touch, taste and sound, our brains would have nothing to encode. I could cut a living brain open right now, but you wouldn't see anything. It's just meat with electrical impulses firing into it. But if it's your brain, then you can recall the best tasting burger first kiss or something horrible like a film which scared you with ease because your brain has encoded that information into the neocortex and the limbic system through our five senses and be it pleasurable or fearful the response to that stimuli is now ingrained basically neuro-linguistic programming means that we interpret and store everything how we see hear touch taste smell it justice is medieval primeval but also, as societies progressed, it's also become more dignified. And without justice, there would be no society because right and wrong wouldn't exist. It was one of the reasons why the first Purge film appealed to so many. I wasn't a fan of its sequels, but I did enjoy the first. As it showed the importance of law and order and how, when you apply order to disorder, in other words, even the insane butchery and torch of whoever you wanted could only last for 24 hours. Then it opened up a debate and a moral argument in the viewer's head about class, honour, fear, societal standards, and also where we're heading in society based upon your subjective evidence of crimes you may have experienced or the news you watch on TV. Be it John Wick, I Spit on Your Grave, Spider-Man, or even Judge Dredd, Justice plays to our personalities, development and internalised view of the world and there's a lot of fun to be had in movies and books. After all, we have seen heinous crimes and also stupid ones. Take the UK's recent coronavirus public inquiry where the politicians' parties during lockdown were investigated. Or the Netflix documentary Making a Murderer where doubt was cast upon a horrible crime. Basically, all of these inspired debate, anger outrage and condemnation for different reasons. And our brains have synaptic plasticity, which means they can grow and evolve. And that's why justice and punishment, restoration and frustration with the real world criminal system keeps changing as we understand more factors and we develop as a society. However, in movies, sometimes things are just black and white and we want Batman to get the bad guy no matter what. And we revel in it because even though it's all made up and pure fiction, 
We love to see balance being restored because it triggers those emotions of empathy, righteousness, anger, and so much more, which day to day in the real world aren't always metabolized. And so we turn to art, in this case movies, for them to have a channel and a conduit to be processed. Anyway, that's it for this week's video. So remember that psychology is cool. Please consider subscribing as this really helps me make new videos and a like and share is always welcome. And hey, comments are always welcome too as health debates good on here. And as ever, until next time, I'll catch you later. Judgment time.